Welcome to episode two, our discussions from the 35th Annual Space Symposium Exhibit Hall. Right from our booth, they continue. Here we go. With me now I have Bob Hall. He is the Director of Operations for the Commercial Space Operations Center with the ComSpark. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Josh. We're taking a few minutes to talk about some of the things that Bob has done in his career. How long have you been in the space business? Uh, my entire career has been space business. So 300 years? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Now, exactly. sure, it's in the 20, 30 years uh, time frame? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you used to. Sure. <laughs> you started on Discus? I, I did. I, 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 I worked as a contractor flying uh, Discus satellites for the Air Force on console. Very cool. So, you a lot of operations experience. Yeah, it's very yes. great for your role Absolutely. currently at the ComSpark. Yeah, I did that, did that out there for a period of time and then transitioned to work for the vehicle manufacturer uh, out in Valley Forge. And so I was one step removed, but at that point I took on responsibility for uh, the entire fleet of disc satellites we had. Oh, wow. When the on-console people had a problem, I was their point of contact to, to, to basically uh, call for help. To put, so, put out the fires in space. So exactly. Yeah. And I had a team of people, subject matter experts for the various systems. Yeah. So uh, and, and we've worked together for for a number of years. Yep. Three hundred. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, well, maybe two ninety nine. That's right. And uh, you know, it, a lot of your experience so far has been in the operations world, and I know that you have been involved with uh, a lot of not just with that job, but with your with your. Uh, with your role at AGI, you've done a lot of anomaly investigations and things that have things that have gone wrong wrong in space, and you have been on the team to help troubleshoot them. Can you can you go into a little bit about some of those stories, some sure. of those details? Sure. So so um, what you're referring to is we uh, for a period of time we had a whole team that I, I was heading up, uh, sort of a flight dynamic support or, or mostly for anomaly support. So anomaly resolution, I think you called it, right? Yeah. yeah. So so what would happen is. You know, we're a software company, we sell SDK and then eventually ODTK, uh, and you hear from time to time about a customer having an operational problem. We would dive in with both feet and bring together the full power of our software and uh, subject matter expertise, because we have plenty of that AGI, and, and we would attack the problem in such a way as to assist the spacecraft operator who had a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there were times, for example, where we, we were working nearly around the clock, and we were modifying SDK on the fly. Modifying the code. Modifying the actual software in SDK to be able to do things we, and ingest the data types we had. And we, so there was a satellite that was dropped off in a, a really. Are you allowed uh, to say names? Suboptimal orbit. Are you allowed to say names? It's uh, been a I while. Don't know. It's been a while. So. <laughs> Well, so it was dropped off in a. In Rhymes a, with Schmazasat 3? No, 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 no. Not no. that one? No, oh, okay. a different one. It was dropped off in a suboptimal orbit and a really bad attitude. In fact, the operator with their tools was unable to figure out the attitude of the thing. Turned out it was tumbling quite rapidly. Mm. And you were able to help them get it back on track? We you put didn't? together a team, and like I said, we were changing SDK, and we were able to basically do the attitude determination after a few days and say, here's where you are. Awesome. And, and then they subsequently were able to, to move on from that, so that was good. So how, how many of these anomalies have you personally been involved with over the years? Uh, at AGI or total? Just total. Total, yeah. total of, of, of dozens. dozens and dozens, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it's, I mean, anomalies, they're called anomalies, but they seem to happen quite often. And uh, Sure, sure. And, and, and that's when you need to, to, to put your knowledge to the test, because obviously things are, are non-standard at that point, and, and you want to get the spacecraft back online as quickly as possible. So you're a big proponent of testing out every contingency that makes sense to prior to flight so that you're ready for these oh, sure. things yeah. when they come out. We, we routinely did that in ops. We, we had all kinds of procedures pre-written for all the, the various things we're, that were seen as likely as could go wrong. Yep, as uh, many dress rehearsals as you can get. Yep. And, and then again, on the AGI side, so we supported that mission. There was another mission which was actually the first commercial use of the moon, was a commercial ComSat, AgeSat 3 was launched. That's what I joked about and, earlier. And, yeah, yeah. And, and they were, stra the, the upper stage stranded them in an orbit that was not where they were supposed to be left. All right, you know, explain for everybody what the first commercial use of the moon means. So, so, so prior to that, uh, there had been uh, the Apollo mission to the moon and the, the Soviets back in the 60s and the, and the US had sent landers to the moon, uh, but there was really no commercial satellites that had ever done anything with the moon. And so this, this satellite, which was stranded, uh, unfortunately was in the wrong plane. And to change the plane, think of the, you know, the bicycle tire that's spinning. If you want to turn the way that wheel is is turning, it, it takes a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true with satellites. And so, they had they didn't have enough fuel to be able to get to the right plane. Uh, however, uh, an ingenious uh, way was designed to basically uh, 
extend the size of the orbit, or the size of the loop, if you will, all the way out to the moon, and yet fly close enough to the moon that the moon basically pulled the satellite's orbit and tilted the plane. So by using the moon, it used the gravitational pull of the moon for an assisting swing by. Yeah, exactly. To, to change the orbit. Yep, yep. And, so and it didn't so land on the moon, but it yeah. used its gravity to, right. to and orbit it, And change. it worked so well that they did it again a month or two later to further refine it. Now, swing bys are not new. NASA's used them as far back as the 70s, at least, on some mm -hmm. of the probes that went further into the solar system. But again, for a commercial satellite to use a, a, a body, uh, a celestial body, to, to modify its orbit. This was the first time. That's pretty cool. That's yeah, and, and then we've had others like that where, again, our philosophy has always been, we're gonna do the right thing to help the operator. And if we can use our software and our expertise to, to provide value to them, great. They may become a customer, they may not become a customer. We wanna get them successful. Uh, and, and it's kind of like a pay it forward Sat thing. Satellites first, you got a bumper sticker, it says yeah, right. satellites first, something but like it, that. It really is that the HI philosophy of like pay it forward, mm -hmm. do the right thing, and if we do the right thing, you know, the next time that they have a need for something, they, they might be more likely to say, you sure. know, the SDK really helped out and those guys know what they're doing. No, because it's, it's great work that you're doing because, uh, you know, when satellites go bad, it's bad for everyone. Right, right, Because right. that's more junk up there, more, you know, take out other things that we, other people rely on. So anything you can do for keeping space healthy and active and sustained is fantastic. So I know you, uh, run the daily operations of the Commercial Space Operations Center, and that is a, you have a global network of sensors, and you're taking observations uh, 24 hours a day, and you guys are processing them and coming up with a catalog. And so, give me an idea a little bit about the day-to-day, -day, what you see in your role at the comm spot. So, the really interesting thing about, about that work, to me, is, is the unusual. So, there's a lot that happens in space. So, so for example, there's probably, Given all the satellites, the active satellites in space, there's probably 3,000 maneuvers a month going on in space. That's a lot. But guess what? 99.999% of those are routine. Right. That the operator is doing something intentional to adjust the orbit, maintain the orbit, maintain a location where they want to be. 3,000 orbits. 3,000 uh, maneuvers done on how many satellites? Uh, active satellites. Probably 1,500-ish satellites. Okay. And it's it's not evenly distributed, but still. Sure. Um, so there's a lot goes on, and, and, and we, we monitor that. Our, our software, our procedures, our team, we monitor all that. Our software's really great at automatically solving for those maneuvers, characterizing them. The interesting part to me is the unusual, so it's the needle in the haystack. Okay, So, give me a for example. So, so for example, we, the, the Chinese and the Russians are doing uh, lots of new and, 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 and interesting things with some of their missions, where they're testing out new te technologies. And the so, Indians now too as well? The Indians now too. Uh, oh, that was um, rather short-lived right. in a sense. Right. Uh, there wasn't, you know, it, it happened the and now we're watching the debris. Right, it's not the on-orbit things that you're talking right. about that right. stay so, up and, and keep doing interesting things. Right, so the, the Russians have a satellite that was launched in 2014 and has spent uh, over four years now uh, going around the geo belt, parking next to commercial communication satellites. And, and they're not rendezvousing, they're not real close so they could reach out and do damage or anything. We say, well, why are they doing that? Well, using SDK, you can totally see that they are close enough to intercept the uplink communications going to that satellite. Uh, so, and that's, that's quite interesting. So, so it's space cuddling. It's yeah, space cuddling. Not nearly right. as fun as it sounds. Right, and, and, and so we're actually, when we get home, we're going to uh, do a, a more extensive video going yep, through the history of, of Lucha Limp because it's, it's pretty interesting all the places yeah. they've gone. When we get back to headquarters, Bob, Bob's going to do a full presentation of the entire life and everything, everywhere it stopped along the way and all the details that we know about what, the, right. what that satellite has been up to. Because some of them uh, are, are even more interesting they, they, you know, than, than the regular stops, if you will. Right. And then on top of that, you have the, the Chinese. The Chinese are doing lots and lots of testing. So we've watched, they are really practicing rendezvous and prox ops quite a bit as they refine so their procedures, they what, test their what, procedures. What, what have you seen that you can talk about? That uh, we, we've seen them test probably at least four different times. Uh, one of their uh, newer satellites, SJ-17, has, has rendezvoused with another Chinese satellite, mm -hmm. four different Chinese satellites. And, and each time it's a little bit different engagement as they, apparently they have a test program they're going through uh, and they sometimes get really close. So with, and with our sensors, we've, we've been able to tell that they've, and in one instance, they probably got within 500 meters of the other object. 
That's pretty close. It, it's space, really close. Space terms, that's pretty close. Really right. close because yeah. uh, any little error in your calculation about your orbit, and you guys could be running into each other. Yes. Even when you're on the same team, so to speak. Yeah, and, and you mentioned proximity operations and rendezvous, and that's sort of a, a lot of people talking about that here at Space Symposium. Yep. It's it's not all for nefarious purposes. There's also a lot of refueling and repair missions. It's just it's an interest. In, this, in the industry of being able to go up to other satellites and have them do things to each other. Could be good, could be bad. Yep. And yep. Uh, from your point of view, being a, watching the satellites and doing non-cooperative uh, observations so their satellites aren't telling you what they're doing, exactly. when they get close to each other, it gets pretty hard to tell them apart sometimes. It, it does, I mean, we, we have, unfortunately, we have uh, great software with our ODTK-based uh, filter smoother at the heart of everything we do. And then we layer that with maneuver detection, characterization, ops association. Uh, there are times when you know you, we need a person in the loop. Our operators got to you know dig in and really help resolve what's going on. And, and you're right; that these totally could be what we call dual-use technologies. Mm -hmm. They could be studying on-orbit servicing, but at the same time, you can't refute that they could have a military component to their right. rendezvous practice. Right. So far, like I said, they practice against Chinese objects. But but again, it's it's that. Being able to characterize what these satellites are up to and quickly, so so when they move, being able to identify very rapidly that they're on the move, and then we have other tools that help us identify before they get there where they're going. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where where we're going with some of our top software tools. It's really really interesting to me to be able to say three days ahead of time, oh, they're going to go rendezvous with that satellite, and then we kind of watch it unfold. Right. So, so a, a, another thing we can bring to bear here is not just the orbit and where the thing is, but we can look at the stability of an object. So we've, we've seen a few times now where a satellite has gone unstable. So in some cases, the Stable attitude-wise. The satellite is not, no longer oriented the way it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, the satellite should be in a fairly uh, fixed orientation. The solar rays turn to continue to collect energy, but the, the satellite payload should be Earth-facing. And we've seen times when that doesn't happen. So, we had a time a couple years ago where the operator calls us and says, hey, we've lost our satellite, can you help us? And so we went and found it. It turned out it had been, it had moved quite a bit. Um, and then we were also able to see very quickly that this thing was tumbling. And we were able to pick off the tumble rate. So we could tell, we told the operator, hey, you are tumbling, you're way over here, and this is how often you're tumbling. So you did that all with your optical tracking. Yes, so when you get a signal, and they were getting these intermittent signals, set your stopwatch, and the next time around is gonna be 19 minutes later. So be ready to start commanding 19 minutes after the last time. And they eventually nursed that satellite to the graveyard. It was They weren't able to salvage it, but they got it to the graveyard, which is great, because they, they got it out of the way of other satellites. Right. Uh, another one we, uh, we've seen, again, the, the things that we can learn just from SSA. So last year in the summertime, there was a Chinese communication satellite that we can tell had an anomaly, and it was unstable very, very briefly, and then began to drift away from where it was supposed to be. The inter interesting thing about that is, a few days later, they sent this SJ-17 satellite racing over to come and rendezvous with it. So it was kind of like an unplanned rendezvous. Huh. And to Maybe all appearances, take a look or just, yeah, to all appearances they, they park near it, you know, single digit kilometers, not uber close. The closest they got was like one and a half kilometers. So uh, no, no data that would suggest that they went and did something, but it sure looks like they raced over there and they looked for a while and then they must have gotten to a point where they're comfortable and then they started to maneuver the original satellite to slow it down and, and kind of get it back to where it belongs. And after enough of that time, SA-17 went back back to its home. So we're, we're gonna, that's another one we're gonna cover in more detail. Yep. I, I look forward to it. Me too. Well, thanks Bob for the time. I appreciate the insight. I look forward to going into a little bit deeper dive when we have a little more time and a little less noise. All right. And uh, thank you. Thank you.